Um, now I, I would like to invite our distinguished uh, panelist and our moderator, Mr. Yaakov Michlin, the CEO of Isum of the Hebrew University, who will, uh, who will talk on uh, profiling tomorrow's Ag Solution. Welcome. So thank you very much, Nitsa, and please, the five uh, panelists, please join me here on the stage. And I will introduce to you during the, the panel. So, uh, the thank you to the minister and uh, Steve and Nitsa for the warm word. Actually, we have a very uh, high responsibility here in this panel because we are actually the, some kind of a plenary session in uh, terms of a panel. So what we are going to do in order to keep the audience uh, interested, we have a distinguished uh, panel of actually representing here, I think, uh, 60 or 70 percent of a certain industry in the agriculture are represented here on the, on the stage with a representative of the government. So what we will do, we have uh, three rounds of uh, questions, different questions. I will introduce the, each of the panelists in the first question. And at the second stage, uh, Avi, you will have the hard job if, because we are going to challenge you of uh, what the government is going to do in order to help us uh, fulfill our plans. So be prepared to the last uh, part and I hope we will have a few minutes remaining. So I will start uh, with our uh, first, uh, by the order of my questions. Uh, so Philip, uh, Dr. Philip Hervé is the head of R&D and Alliance Management at Bayer Corp Sciences, um, in charge of managing partnership worldwide across the range of, the range of expertise in agriculture. So the first uh, question that I'm going to ask all of you in order not to repeat uh, this question, we are here in a panel of actually, and as Nitsa already mentioned, Profiling the future of Ag Solution. And what I want to ask all of you as a first question is, first of all, you have been doing business with Israel for a while, and I know most of you from uh, past experience. The first question will be, what is the most interesting technology you have seen so far in Israel? And what is your dream technology, such technology that once you will see it, you say, wow, I want to be the first one that will invest in this technology. So. Philip, you have the first uh, option to answer. So I'm, I'm the lucky one, so I can pick the one I like. <laughs> now I think what's amazing uh, in, in Israel, and we don't see that in any other place, is, is how to optimize the, the, the use of resources that is required for doing agriculture. Uh, obviously, the most important one is the use of, of water. So I've seen Israel is, has been positioned as the best place to, uh, to use water and how to use water for agricultural purposes. Uh, and I won't mention any precise one, so I leave room for my <laughs> colleagues to say something. But I think this is really amazing. And, and in the two organized, this is, this is really the, the highlight, uh, beyond even what we may think about. Uh, the dream technology, well, a company that can, that can control weather would be perfect. <laughs> you know, a company that can make the rain happen earlier yeah, in Israel, for example. Uh, but no, seriously, I think, again, we, we have great opportunities to see more technology in, in resource management still. Uh, better soil management practices and so on. There are still a lot of opportunities. And I think Israel is very well positioned to build upon that. Thank you. Uh, the second uh, panel is the Mr. Per Crevion. Head of Apiotic Stress Management, Crop Enhancement in uh, Syngenta, an old partner of uh, Isum, I must say, and also of uh, Israel, a former Israel, or a current Israel. Uh, uh, so, Pelek, same question. In terms of technologies that are interesting, um, there are many. Um, I think we've seen things from computational biology, to particular genetics, to particular 
uh, chemistry, uh, and there, there are many. Um, so I wouldn't single any single one <laughs> at this point. Any, but I think that what we're seeing and, and the way that Syngenta has been looking at, at its business over the last couple of years has been looking at it through crops. So technologies that fit multiple crops and actually make a real difference or a breakthrough are the stuff that makes it interesting. Because we many times face a particular vegetable, you know, watermelons, or, um, you know, here in Israel you have a lot of chickpeas and hummus. Huh? You know, it's great, but for a company of our size, many times that is uh, relatively small. So the applicability doesn't have to be proven across everything, but the applicability across multiple crops is what makes it interesting, or the applicability across multiple uh, geographical zones or climates and so on. I think that in terms of a dream technology that would have to fit a lot of those boxes or, or check most of those boxes. Um, the other piece which I see a lot of potential for, and that's also due to some of my history in, in software and so on, is uh, decision support tools. Uh, really looking at places where uh, we turn a lot of the data which is prevalent uh, into something that a farmer can actually say, this is what I need to do. Uh, and it has to do with the weather and the conditions. So for me, a wow technology or a wow um, investment worthy type of company would be the one that would put all the pieces together and enable us to offer a grower the opportunity to manage risk better. And the most important thing for us at least is scale, at scale, geographies, crops, and so on. And then by the way, the technologies that would fit into that would be from Monsanto or from Bayer or from Syngenta or from any of the small companies that are here uh, put together. So it's not a Syngenta only type of approach. Thank you. Um, Dr. Virginia Olsen, or uh, I understood your name is Ginny, mm -hmm. and Technology Prospecting Lead, Science Fellow, Monsanto Research, and I know from your uh, CV that you already sold one startup to Monsanto in your past. So tell us from your experience, what's the best technology you have seen so far in Israel, and what is your dream technology? So I'm going to pass on my favorite technology in Israel because there's too many out there that might get offended that I didn't pick theirs. <laughs> So all of them. Um, so I, I think to the question of, of what um, we are looking for, so you're gonna, I think you're, thematically this is going to be very similar. And I, and I think I would just put it in a slightly different way. So every time a, a farmer puts a seed in the ground, he's taking a tremendous risk. And de-risking agriculture by taking out um, or, or managing as many variables as possible is, is going to be a, essential. So when I think about the type of work Monsanto does in GMOs, we're, we're trying to maximize the intrinsic yield of a crop. We're doing, and, and that intrinsic yield can, can be managing uh, response to stress, whether it be biotic or abiotic, but we're not controlling the weather. We're not controlling what's going, but what's happening below ground. And the extent to which we can, or, and we're not controlling the price of oil, which is a huge input for every time a farmer has to drive his tractor across the field, the cost of driving that tractor can, can double because of, of the, um, the fossil fuel inputs. And so I, I, I look at, at technologies for the future as those that, that just start, start attacking some of these variables. So in the case of weather, is the predictive tools and then, and then being able to react once the predictive tools have, have created an alert of some sort. Um, broader climate trends that can allow a farmer to custom, you know, to, to plant specific seed um, one year because the, the climate trends are, are, are predicting a warmer or a colder um, year, managing water, managing nutritional inputs. Um, and so the more that can be um, managed I mean, the, the dream crop would be one that makes its own nitrogen so you don't have to drive across, but tractor across the field to add nitrogen. I mean, that, that may happen someday. But bringing together the massive amounts of information, um, developing algorithms, algorithms and technologies that basically can de-risk the process of growing plants and allow us to get closer and closer to that intrinsic yield every single crop cycle. Um, and it's, it's going to be an absolute mosaic of technologies. It's going to be 
thinking about bringing technologies together now that may be, um, appear very separate, but um, maybe could be brought together in a unique way um, to bring some of these, these solutions. Thank you. Dr. Margaret Donalek from PepsiCo is actually the only representative in this panel of uh, the areas of uh, food and nutrition, which I think is also a very important uh, field in which uh, Israel is very strong at. And uh, Margaret holds the current uh, role of Global Head of Technology Scouting for PepsiCo. And I would like to ask you the, the same question. If in your areas of expertise, and I know that you have been to Israel few times we have met in the past as well, and I'm sure that you saw many of the startups and the incubator companies here. Um, so what, what if you can share with us, not a specifically a certain company, but the kind of technology that you found most uh, interesting in Israel, and uh, what is your dream technology as PepsiCo? Okay, so I, I think I'm going to um, build on what uh, Philippe and Pelag and Virginia have said, um, and, and put it in maybe an angle of specifically for PepsiCo, but I think really raises the larger challenge, at least in my mind. Um, uh, we have a tremendous investment in crop science. It's a new capability build within PepsiCo. We're actively seeking partners. We're actively seeking knowledge in this area. Visibility for us is to be able to be present today uh, with my colleague, Dr. Lysing Wong, to understand and better integrate into the, uh, the ecosystem within Israel. It's, it's tremendous for us, and we thank you for that opportunity. I think that, that one of the challenges that we face really is twofold within PepsiCo, um, and this is where the technology exists, but maybe the wow will be where it still needs to go. Uh, within our crop science or our ag science discipline, we have two key pillars. One is really, as Virginia has talked about, which is advantaging the farmer from the standpoint of growth and productivity. Um, that obviously helps us. It's going to help the farmer. We view that as the farmer that's more productive with his land, can afford food, or maybe better food for his family, and thus is going to be a healthier farmer and produce a healthier crop. We also look at the sustainability aspects to farming as a key to any innovation that we take on. So if we look at water utilization being critical as a global uh, natural resource uh, constraint, how do we manage better productivity of crops where we also have, let's say, better irrigation practices, but also potentially the need to grow crops in areas of the world where that where water that's used to grow that crop does not exist. In other words, giving us that flexibility as a food product manufacturer so that we can locate the products in the country where we want to sell, better for the economy of that country, et cetera. Um, I think with those common threads here, the challenge is from a PepsiCo perspective, and this is really where the wow factor comes in, um, let's say that we're able to produce um, uh, an oat varietal that's uh, better nutritionally. Um, and we have the uh, genetic capabilities with company partnerships that could do that for us. The problem is, is what if that enriched protein, oat for example, doesn't process well in our manufacturing plants and doesn't taste as good when it gets to the consumer? The one challenge for PepsiCo is we can do everything that we need to in sustainability and in crop science, but if it doesn't meet the consumer mark, to be honest, none of us are going to sell it. And so I think the biggest challenge that we face, and at least what we acknowledge as a food and beverage company with our tremendous stake in potatoes, oats, citrus, and corn, is how to make sure that we're not losing the consumer-facing attributes, or let's say, maybe more general, the market-facing attributes. For us, it's the consumer products that we make with those raw materials um, as we innovate. Because if we can do all of that together, we really do have sustainable agriculture. If we don't, we're going to have innovation which is very relevant, but potentially only timely. And it's not going to be timeless. And that's obviously, I think, the bigger trend and the bigger challenge really building on what the Minister of Agri Agriculture said. Thank you. I think that this discussion, and before I turn to our uh, 15 uh, distinguished panelists, I think that this discussion of the brainstorming between uh, 
the companies is an important thing and what you just touched on it and at least my, our impression uh, both in also in the academia the startups the incubators the arena is that we are in a bit missing the link to the end the uh, consumer at the end so I think one of the main roles of uh, companies at your size is in uh, actually working with startup companies in Israel is to link the huge innovation taking place in Israel to the actual needs of the consumer, whether it's the farmer or the consumer that really buys the PepsiCo products in the supermarket. So I think it's a very important uh, message. And uh, our last and uh, fifth uh, distinguished uh, panelist, Professor Avi Perl, uh, Chief Scientist at the Ministry of Agriculture, the Government of Israel, of course. Uh, Avi also is a senior research uh, scientist at the head of the Great Biotechnology and Breeding Unit in the Agricultural Research Organization, which in Israel we call simply Mahon Vulcani. So uh, Avi, please share with us from your um, past experience, also as a researcher and in your role in the Ministry of Agriculture, what is the, you think, the, the main area in Israel, the leading one, and what is the wow technology from your perspective? Thank you. Uh, actually, it's amazing a little bit to see that the answer I prepared since we had the questions in advance. Uh, it's very similar to what was said before, although I had no idea what the other uh, people in the panel are going to say. But actually, our dream technology is a, brought, is a technology we are currently uh, supporting uh, the research uh, together with uh, some leading scientists and several companies involved is what we call the Facebook of agriculture. And it's very similar to what we had uh, here, uh, here before, what we call Agripedia, which is actually a huge uh, agri-cloud database, which is, uh, comes together with a computerized multi-criteria decision support system. And the real goal in here is actually we cannot control the weather, but we can minimize the dependency of production in agriculture in what we call God. So, and the idea is just we understand that production in agriculture is production in a very hostile environment because it's a, it, it's a multifactorial system that change all the time and interact in a different way on a daily basis. It involves genetics, physiology, environment, climate, uh, diseases, pests. All of them are unpredictable factors. They interact and change daily. And actually, it renders production in agriculture in respect of volume and quality actually impossible. In the technology we are trying to develop, and I'm sure we are not the only one, but several groups are trying to do it all over, is actually it's going to enable farmers, either big or small, to be supported through cellular phone or any other device with the information or suggestion what to do, when to do it, and what will be the future consequences of performing some horticultural practice. For example, if we, if you, we need to spray nitrogen as a horticultural treatment, but in two days from now it's going to be 30 degrees Celsius in a specific, in, with interaction with a specific type of, so, of soil and a specific cultivar, it can result with a crop drop or crop loss. This multifactorial interaction, a human brain can hardly cope this, with that's why we need the DSS system. The technology can open the door for dramatic progress in better management of production system, in reducing food losses, and, in, and it's going to have a powerful impact in uh, ensuring worldwide uh, food security. Thank you. Uh, Philip, I'll go uh, back uh, to you. What does Bayer see as the main challenges in crop sciences going forward? And what are actually the, the most hot areas in, uh, when you are looking for projects from the Bayer perspective, what, what you are looking to find here in Israel, whether in the startups, the academia, or a later stage companies? OK, so I'm really so lucky when I always get uh, the first shot, so it's good. <laughs> so first. <laughs> So first, I like surprises, so this Agripedia is a great stuff, because I, I believe that one thing that can have a quick win is that farmers, they share more their knowledge and, and how they manage a farm, you know, because, and especially when you, you know, how do you transfer the knowledge from one generation to the next, 
when agriculture is in most part of the world not a, a very attractive sector for, for young generations. So that's a great idea. I like it. Uh, congratulations for that. Now, back to the challenge. Uh, well, let's say we see a lot of opportunities for outside of our company. We see quite some challenges inside our company. The challenge is very simple. For us, we see the development cost of any product, whatever product, chemical, seeds, biologicals will follow. Any solution we bring to the market takes time and we have increasing development cost. So the immediate, and our R&D budget can grow but cannot grow exponentially. So as a consequence, like in the pharma industry, and at BioHealthcare, we have the same situation. We have to balance smartly our R research and D cost. That means if we increase our development costs that only the large corporate can do, um, because we are the one driving the product to the market, then we have to find a way how to manage the research cost. And so, the challenge is there, and so the opportunity is how we build ecosystems outside of our organization in the right places in the world to make that research happen and to a stage that we are ready as a large corporate to bring to our development pipeline. And, and too early is not good because a large corporate may deprioritize a great idea if it was coming too quickly in our pipeline. So the, the, the opportunity I see and the other areas for Israel is how Israel is going to build up uh, 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 its innovation ecosystem. How you are going to integrate things happening from public organization, startup companies, medium-sized company, and how the medium-sized company in Israel will play a key role to, to nurture this, this innovation. That, that's uh, what I can answer. Thank you, Pelek. I would like to take you back to your former job uh, within uh, the huge organization of Syngenta. Can you share with us where Syngenta is heading in terms of water technologies and what are you looking for in this context in Israel in the big picture of uh, Syngenta? I'll try. <laughs> But first, I want to say thank you to Philip here, who everything he just said, you could take to Syngenta, and basically it would be exactly the same viewpoint when it comes to the challenges of the big corporations versus uh, the rest of the industry. Um, now, going back to, to the water um, sphere within Syngenta. As simplistic as it sounds, is water is almost everything when we talk about agriculture. And I'll give you one example. Um, I was recently in Australia, and um, drought obviously is one of the biggest problems there. Uh, so cereals growers actually go and plant earlier because they want to avoid the drought stress or at least minimize that risk. But then they're hit with frost. So I could tell you that I'm looking for frost solutions even though they're driven by the water problem. Um, although it sounds maybe counterintuitive when I say that's why today my role is I'm responsible for a business unit or an indication as we call it, uh, which is looking at all the abiotic stresses ranging from cold to frost to heat and so on. But it all started with water as the first instance because that's a driver for a lot of the other ones. More specifically, depending on the crop, depending on the growth stage, depending on the geography, we have different challenges to meet when it comes to water. Uh, so, obviously, if you're an irrigated versus if you're a rain-fed farmer, take corn as the example. Um, you know, the industry is obviously brewing and, and uh, bringing products to market, which are, you could call them drought-tolerant hybrids, whether it's GM or non-GM. Um, we're looking at um, what we call them water-optimized at Syngenta. Now, why do we call them water-optimized is because if you're an irrigator, you're less worried about the drought per se, you're worried about how much water do I have to irrigate with. Um, so you could see different genetic chassis and, and, and technologies that are relevant for that for corn in the US corn belt. Uh, when you look at Italy, you'd have a different story in mind. When you look at tomatoes and peppers grown here in Israel in the Arava, uh, a lot of the challenges have to do with salinity. And again, applying the right amount and so on. Um, cereals, you have 
heat stress that comes along with the drought stress. So you're looking at technologies that actually fit both. So there's the genetic part, which frankly, as uh, Ginny said earlier, I mean, once the farmer puts that in the ground, he's kind of made his bet. The question is, and this is where my business is, is what can he do after that? Uh, once I've put that and said, okay, I believe my chances are so, once I get a weather report that says 10 days from now we're expecting a drought or we're expecting a heat wave, or by the way, we're expecting a flood, uh, what do I do and how do I apply a specific product or change a specific practice to actually meet that challenge that comes along throughout the season? So it's not a single technology silver bullet, it's actually a unified approach, holistic approach throughout the season by crop, by geography. So. That's kind of how water is evolving. We've launched a water solution for Nebraska grower or Midwest growers in the US, which is called Water Plus, where we've shown how farmers combining multiple technologies, ranging from genetics, chemistry, irrigation, um, computational tools, um, uh, um, aerial photography, soil moisture sensing, and so on, can reduce their water by 25% and still increase yields or at least maintain them in a drought year, and last year in the US obviously was a very big success for us. Um, so those are the types of things that Syngenta is looking at. And again, soy would be different in Brazil with El Nino than it is in uh, other parts of the world. So the variety is quite large. Thank you. Actually, in Israel, uh, things are changing fast. And uh, from what I hear in the news, we are no, not suffering from drought anymore. So things are changing uh, interestingly. Uh, Ginny, a question to you, and uh, we are touching now a relatively sensitive uh, issue of uh, the use of GMO and uh, R&D in the area of GMO. So I can't do a water question. <laughs> I hate it. <laughs> uh, I want actually, water. Actually, actually, your background as a scientist, uh, you already did what we call the exit uh, deal uh, that we at least uh, some of the people here in the crowd are waiting for. So you already sold the company called uh, Calgin to uh, Monsanto in your uh, past career. In that company, you actually developed a genetically modified soybean containing a novel omega-3 fatty acid. Do you find this uh, GMO approach in general growing more and more? Or do you think that we will see less and less uh, GMO? And I know that you have uh, a competitor mm -hmm. Uh, sitting uh, right next to you. And where is Monsanto heading uh, forward in this context of the use of GMO compared to other ways? Wow, well, there's a lot of questions in there. I'll start with water. <laughs> um, no. So the, let's, so let's go back to the, the omega-3 story. And um, as some people in the room know, I could talk about this um, all day long. When when Calgin was acquired by Monsanto, this was a project that was in sort of a medium stage of maturity. We had technical proof of concept and we needed to achieve uh, some clinical proof of concept. And once that was achieved, um, Monsanto, even though it, at that point was not carrying on many of the old nutrition projects, agreed to fund the omega-3. And I remember specifically sitting in Rob Fraley's office talking about the need for Monsanto to have a consumer benefit product. And so that was funded, even though I, I don't believe Monsanto ever believed they'd make any money on a high omega-3 soybean. They did, um, at least at one point in time, believe that having a product like that would be very beneficial for the public acceptance. Um, you know, unfortunately, our business model is we sell seed. And so although I was allowed to continue to develop the product, and it should be, it's achieved um, deregulation at the USD level. It's being um, developed for commercial uh, production by a partner. It should receive FDA approval any, I mean, any day now. Monsanto chose not, they just, it wasn't, they couldn't reconcile their existing business model with a product like that. And, and it's unfortunate, and we had worked very hard with some food companies uh, to try and partner, and, and, and in fact, our, we have a history of, of trying to do that on a, on a very closely related molecule. And we ran into some of the same problems. Um, it's very hard for a seed company uh, to be a food company. I mean, it's impossible. As a food company, you can't, you can't be a Monsanto. And so a, a learning, there is a learning in there for me, and that is that, um, 
you, you know, a company absolutely has to stay with um, what its core, what it is good at, what its core is. That core is where we've invested our development dollars, not our research dollars. And, um, and I think the three of our, our companies are, are very similar in that our development pipelines are, are second to none. Um, so then back to this questions of acceptance. Would, would a high omega-3 soybean have had any impact on uh, the current debate, not not at all, because I don't believe the current debate is really rooted in in those types of issues. It's rooted in in you know political um, factors. Um, however, that said, I think Monsanto has finally this year um, really recognized that we can't ignore the issue anymore. So our customers are farmers. Farmers want the best seed that money can buy. And we have been providing our farmer customers with the best seed. They've been extremely happy. Our market share grows every single year. And so there's no problem with our product. However, the noise around GMO um, is starting to make it challenging. The, if the food industry can't sell a product with an ingredient that, that was, was generated by GMO, that's going to start affecting farmers. And so were we a little slow in recognizing that? Probably. But we just fundamentally believed that if you put a good product on the market that had demand, and when we talk to our farmer customers, their question isn't, what are you going to do about GMO labeling? It's, when am I going to get my next product? Um, you know, products where I can put, you know, that de basically de-risk de -risk my operation. Um, we we just have a ton of work to do in that. So is the future GMO or non-GMO? I would say that I I don't know what it, the future is going to be. The biggest threat to GMO right now in our future is not the debate per se. It is the cost of regulatory and the cost of development of GMO products. It is getting to the point where it's not sustainable. And when the regulatory paradigms are such that as we start stacking genes and, and our industry is I think we've all come to grips with the fact that yield isn't going to happen in a single gene, nor are the complex traits we're working on going to be achievable through a, you know, a single magic bullet. The regulatory paradigms are going to make developing these complex products almost impossible. I mean, just the sheer acres you would have to plant to do the regulatory trials when they require each parent of a cross. So there is a threat um, to the future of, of the technology, but it comes in the, in the regulatory um, processes that I believe are responding to the noise around the potential safety issues. Um, that's a huge, just a huge, um, it's a huge issue. And it's, some, it's one that, you know, we not only face it in ag biotech, the pharmaceutical industry faces it. We, we just globally don't do a good job of assessing real risk from perceived risk. But if, if we don't get a handle on it, it's, um, it's going to have a severe impact. As far as other aspects of our future, as, as everyone knows, Monsanto uh, made a big acquisition recently with Climate Corp, and I think that was a very strong signal that we are looking beyond, uh, beyond traits, seeded traits, um, for providing solutions to farmers. And it's really around moving towards a smart farm with a smart tractor, the smartphone that is communicating with, with data systems that are um, allowing very, very precision, you know, on the uh, real time, precise decisions to be made both at planting and each time a tractor has to go to the, through the field, it's very costly and really helping um, manage it at that level. And I think um, combined with, with some of the biologic work we're doing, we're, our GMO sector may, may stay the same size, it may shrink, it may grow, but what's certain is these other areas that we're exploring are growing very, very rapidly to provide this 360 degree solution to farmers. Thank you. And actually, I will turn now. Uh, I'll do a short uh, break in the scientific technological uh, uh, discussion that we have. And I will turn to you, Avi, for a question that is uh, on the, the, I would say, the, the ball game of politics, uh, industry, and uh, science. And I see that we have a representative here, Dr. Smoller from the Ministry of Economy. And I would like to, to ask you the following. The Ministry of Economy made some moves to support life sciences research, including new biotech incubator just initiated recently, and the support of uh, VCs investing in life sciences. I know that we are so nicely hosted by the only uh, incubator for agriculture in Israel, which is the uh, MOFET. And I would like to ask you, as the chief scientist of the Ministry of Agriculture, what are the plans of the government in terms of support of innovation in agriculture? 
both in the academic stage and in the comp at the company's level. And uh, uh, he's in question if w these plans are going to be run by your office or in the hands of the Ministry of Economy. Okay, uh, actually, Minister Shamir, by his short uh, speech, mentioned some of the answers to this uh, question, but I, I can elaborate a little bit. Uh, and of course, I can talk about the policy and the strategic program of the Minister of Agriculture, not of the government by itself. So the goal of the Ministry of Agriculture is to position Israel as a worldwide leader center for agriculture R&D and resulting know-how. It's important for us to strengthen the international position of Israel while using its reputation and cutting edge technologies. And uh, it's very important for us to promote the implementation of the agriculture know-how in international markets using the Israeli agriculture industry. In order to achieve some of this, uh, these goals, the government, the government made a decision about it uh, about a year ago, and uh, this decision was followed by uh, what some of you may know as the Eugene Kendall program. And this is, this is a program actually created for the first time since this country exists, a roadmap for Israel to become a global leader and hub for agriculture high-tech technologies. By doing this, actually the government recognized Agritech agri is one of the most exciting and high growth sectors for investment. We hope that the government investment in this area, as well as providing the private sector, what we call the security nets, will attract additional investment from this private sector. Practically, which is in my hands, and what we are planning to, to do, is actually to fund and to establish additional. We have several, but we are going to open <coughs> at least four to six new, what we call excellence center for agriculture innovation. And the goal of these centers is going to develop, adopt, and exploit new technologies in agricultures. In agriculture, the centers will support technology development from the laboratory through the markets. And our mission as the, as the ministry is to provide the conditions that will, will enable the agribusiness, the technology developers, and the investment companies uh, to exploit their position and capitalize on this opportunity. This, this meeting that we participate as the ministry is actually a very nice example of bringing together the science, the industry, and the investors who understand these great opportunities within this emerging uh, new tech market. So can we summarize and to say, to come with a promise of the government from this conference that in 2014 we will see a safety net for investors in agriculture? This is exactly one of the promises you heard from the minister, if you followed it. And uh, the same way that was done with the high-tech industry, the minister, the government is providing the safety net for the investment in case of failure. Same way that the TNUFA fund that he mentioned, uh, the same way that he put the Israeli high-tech on the map, the idea is to, to, to repeat the same uh, protocol with the agriculture. Thank you. Um, Margaret, I'm turning now to you. Uh, I, I guess that there are many startups and also uh, academic projects that are relevant to the food and nutrition uh, area. But, uh, and we have in Israel a uh, very interesting and promising, I think, uh, food industry uh, from Strauss, Nuva, and other uh, companies. When an Israeli startup or an academia wants to get into uh, such a huge organization like uh, PepsiCo, what would you say is the best advantage that, what are the best advantages that you found so far in Israel that you think can serve a giant like uh, PepsiCo? And from what you have seen so far, what would you say the, the soft spots that we have to improve in Israel, what is missing in Israel, and how can we fit into the technologies to get 
I want to, to achieve the goal of having products of PepsiCo in the supermarkets worldwide, embedding Israeli technologies. Okay, thanks. Uh, in fact, I, I could certainly answer the GMO question if you prefer. <laughs> um, we, do, we do have, yeah. <laughs> We have, uh, uh, PepsiCo re recognizes that uh, GMO is a challenge in the market, um, but it certainly is up for discussion. Um, and again, there's a difference in the, in the consumer facing policy and the philosophy. Um, so, uh, but I'll move on. I'll, I could have helped um, uh, Virginia, I think, add some comments to that. We thought that's a very thoughtful and a very provocative answer. Um, PepsiCo is a, is a fantastic company, and I've, I've only been with PepsiCo three years. I came from pharmaceuticals. It's a very, very different environment. Um, there are challenges and opportunities, as there are, I think, with any company. Um, first, I think the, uh, the opportunities, number one, is we have a very strong commitment to external partnerships. Um, even though we're building internal uh, capabilities in crop science, specifically around the commodities that are critical to our business, um, and that's uh, oats, potatoes, corn, and citrus. Um, we understand that there's a lot that we don't know, even if we have established expertise with those um, brands that um, are our flagship with those commodities. Um, I think that, that the opportunity for, um, for collaboration in Israel that is unique, at least why we've been here fairly frequently, in the last couple of years as our crop science organization has started to establish itself is, um, and we saw this again yesterday afternoon at the Technion, is the philosophy that's being articulated in the mul multiple disciplinary integration of uh, into you know, agricultural science or, and, or even basic research where departments are working cross-functionally um, they may not be bringing the market-facing challenges into the table, but they certainly are bringing something more relevant than a single idea or a single opinion. I think that is something that has probably been a focus for Israel in the last many years. Um, in the ag space, it's really going to be critical. I, don't, I think not just for PepsiCo, which needs that information to be able to link our consumer insights um, and our processing uh, constraints, but I think also for um, the seed producers as well and, and for those that supply the irrigation technology, it's, it's the ability to look at not just a single technology in a single vein, but also across how all the challenges come together to solve the problem. Um, I think that, that there are other universities, there are other areas around the world where they're cultivating that type of an approach. I think Israel is committed to that in a very different way. I think the funding structure you have here is going to make that much more feasible to bring, uh, let's say, a package philosophy forward. Um, from the standpoint of challenge, um, we're, we have um, uh, PepsiCo prides itself on a couple of statistics. One is which we have 22 brands within our portfolio that are um, that provide a minimum of a billion US dollars of revenue for the corporation. Um, that's a lot of money for a single brand, especially when it's discretionary calories in snack food and beverages. Um, we sell, we're the largest user of potatoes um, because we sell so many Lay's potato chips. It's the largest single food brand in the, in the world. Um, those statistics don't mean anything though. Um, it, when we look at innovation, except for one important part, it's not the innovation per se, it's scale. Um, I remember I was in PepsiCo for a very short period of time and was asked to broker some technology um, that happened to be a, a bottle closure, so something as simple as a new cap uh, that had some uh, patent technology behind it. My colleague um, who was in the business facing end of our PepsiCo beverage uh, group um, joined me on a conference call. The technology was, the intellectual property was strong. We were very interested in the novelty this was going to bring to the market. When we asked the key question, which um, I was too new at PepsiCo to understand, how, what's your capacity today? Um, and, you know, a little of calculator and a, a quick um, uh, a run of numbers was is that that entire year capacity for that, uh, that 
company was going to probably get us through three to four weeks of production on one of our minor brands. An important brand, but not a major brand. It certainly wasn't, wouldn't have fulfilled Pepsi uh, or um, any of those flagships in the carbonated soft drink world. So I think the challenge is, is, is really after Israel takes on the initiative of, uh, of bringing together multidisciplinary areas for technology pivotable to, add to the ag space. And don't forget the consumer facing, it's still got to taste good and it's still got to process effectively, is going to be how to get the mindset internally within this ecosystem so that we in PepsiCo who don't know how to take small to scale, how do we jointly together figure out that hurdle? Um, because there's got to be a way of doing it. We, we process at a certain level of production and our pilot plants are production. We don't have the ability to, to really understand sometimes. So I think certainly if it's coming to a commodity, um, that's going to be challenging. If it's going to become, if it's going to be relative to agronomic practices, I think it's going to be a lot easier for us to manage. So I'd say it's scale. Thank you. And I will start with you the second round of questions to make it uh, as efficient as possible. Following what you said, and I appreciate what you said about the uh, PepsiCo and uh, all your uh, amazing uh, numbers uh, per brand. But still, when I'm looking from the perspective of whether an Israeli academia or a startup sitting here in the crowd, it's a bit scary because the size of the company, as much as it's an advantage in terms of uh, consumer side, as a researcher or a startup company that wants to tap into your uh, system, what you said, you cannot uh, usually expect a startup to come up with a solution that includes the innovation, the scaling up, and the regulation and everything. You will not find it in a startup, and I don't want to say anything about people sitting here, but probably not many companies here in the crowd can give you all of this package. So we, the startups in Israel do rely on the large companies to do part, if not most, of this work of the scaling and the regulation. So add to this the fact of the non-invented here syndrome, mm -hmm. and please share with us of your view of how, as from the point of view of a startup here in Israel, how do we overcome this, and how do we get into PepsiCo? Oh, all right. Um, I'd say that the, the first response is, in PepsiCo, we do not have the not invented here syndrome. Um, there certainly are areas within our marketing and within our advertising that we don't think anyone knows how to do it any better than we do. That does not pervade our R&D organization, um, even in the applications-oriented uh, organization or those of us that are in the strategic long-term research. Um, I'm here because, and my colleague Lysing Wong is here, because we know we don't know what we need to know about Israel. Um, we're very open with understanding what it is you have. Um, we are try to be very pragmatic when it comes to working through contractual challenges um, with a large company that does have certain expectations. Um, we also know that the biggest challenge we face internally is getting business alignment of something which is three to five years out when in PepsiCo, you only think 18 months out because that's the cycle for the next business and the next cycle of innovations. And we're extremely good at that. So um, for PepsiCo, I think um, helping us understand and maybe putting a few challenges on our, our um, partners is we have to think how to get to the first stage of uh, the first milestone, the first stage of proof of concept as soon as possible and as cheaply as possible. We're not here to do basic research unless we can prove it's worth it. So really looking at taking aside what we attempt to try, what we want to attempt to try to do and try to put a mindset of what's the first big win for PepsiCo. It doesn't have to be scale win, it's just proof. Prove to us that we're on the right track. Not all technologies, whether it be from PepsiCo or the other uh, participants on the panel, they don't have to be commercial successes. We have to be able to learn. So we're willing to invest in more basic technology, assuming that we can put the vision in place for the commercial facing application and try to achieve that first milestone as quickly and as inexpensively as possible to justify the rest of the development program. Thank you. 
uh, to continue to the, on this uh, important uh, issue um, from your experience, both from your uh, past experience in Calgene and uh, actually Monsanto relatively recently acquired uh, at least two companies in Israel, one Biologics and the other uh, Rosetta Green. Uh, would you expect this approach to continue or do you see other ways of collaboration with Monsanto? And following what uh, Margaret just said, is the first stage you must see a proof of concept or you are looking to a more developed stage or you are going, willing to go earlier than this? What is the approach of Monsanto? So I'm going to answer this like an attorney would. It depends. <laughs> Um, so there's no, one thing I, I have learned through the several years I've been doing this, there's, there's no typical transaction. There's no, um, there's really no playbook other than staying within, within sort of the guidelines that your corporate attorneys and contract writers need you to stay within. Um, I got asked, um, you know, I know the tour's only been two days, but, but it seems like forever ago yesterday, um, is the relationship more important or, I think it might have been Debbie who asked me, or is it the techno technological capability of the group that's more important? And, and, and I'm, I'm leading to the answer to the question. And, and it's really, and in my experience and, and perhaps um, our collaborators and the companies we've, we've acquired would um, agree with me or not, um, the technology is the starting point. So if, a, if, if there's a company or a group we're interested in working with and they don't have a technology that we can see, that we can envision how it plugs into, we're, we're pipeline, I mean we have sort of our future and our blue sky, but, but you really describe projects to your uh, leadership or finance about where it plugs into our pipelines. And you, if you can't see that, no matter how early it is, if you really can't see that it's going to work in our pipeline the way it's structured, that's, that's a non-start. If you can see that, you know, then, then it really starts to expand to look at the team. We're talk is this a group that, that um, can, can share the vision with us of where a technology needs to go or not? And, and if the answer is yes, I think, in fact, I would say Evagene is a, is a really nice example of growing with us rather, you know, they, their capacity was, was small, was much smaller when the, when the, I'm looking to, I can't see, the, uh, when the, um, the collaboration began, as was our capability to deal with, you know, the uh, very um, computationally heavy data rich, um, um, product and we've grown together. I think we knew from very early on that the relationship was going to support that type of interaction and um, so that the, the foundations were there um, and we, I, I feel very strongly that we've actually developed together and the reason that you know the, the uh, increased investment and extension was announced was I think other people in the company um, have seen this relationship grow and develop and we're going to apply that technology to some new areas. Um, in the case of the acquisitions, um, those, you know, and I, and I know my colleagues, uh, you know when you see something that you feel is going to be game changing for what you want, you, a technology that you would consider changing how your pipeline runs for. And that's what, we, that's um, I think both uh, in the case of Biologics and Rosetta Green, that's, that's how we felt. In addition to that, we're team, you know, incredibly uh, strong teams where we could look at, look, look at the teams and feel like we were looking at the best in the world. I mean, absolutely best in class, those areas. And there's, I gotta say, there's no substitute for that. Um, so whether something becomes a collaboration or an acquisition is if there's just a there's a, a path uh, that a relationship will take that 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 determines itself. Um, what was the other part of the question? You gave you you gave a good uh, answer, <laughs> but uh, I would like I would like to ask you if you are already here and we are and we are looking for some uh, highlight news from this. Uh, wonderful conference so far, and I hope that it's just getting better. What is the next target for acquisition for Monsanto in Israel? Would you share it with us? 
Um, I don't know. <laughs> That's, that's a good question. One of the things I'm hoping we can get to on the panel, there's been a discussion of gaps, and I, and I think for each of us, there, I, I don't know if we'll, we'll have the time for it, but I think that, um, that where expectation, where we can both, the, the large industry partner, which is uh, anyone who, it, our universes are completely different. A small startup, and having been in a small startup that was acquired by a giant, and I have colleagues in the room, you don't know what you, do. we don't know what we don't know, very clear, it's why we do these types of trips. But a small company, unless they've lived in the environment of a large company, has generally very little clue in what really happens behind the curtain. And I think where relationships can help lift that curtain, I mean, it's obviously not gonna go all the way up unless there's an, an acquisition, but really striving to understand where both sides are coming from and try and, and uh, fill in as many of the unknowns as possible, as early as possible, I think can be, um, can really help those relationships go to their, you know, their, their destiny. Thank you. Peleg, you have uh, the advantage, obviously, in addition to Avi, you are an Israeli. You know what is going on. You know the nature of the Israeli startupists what we call, and the Israeli researchers very, very well. Uh, for the sake of good order, I would say that his father is a researcher in the Hebrew University, but not in the Faculty of Agriculture. Uh, from your perspective, and you have been to water technologies and now crop enhancement, and you are also part of a very large uh, corporation, and you have been to startups. How, and I, I, I heard to summarize that Margaret said proof of concept, Gene is uh, flexible, but still they want to make sure that this is the best technology. From your experience in the huge organization of Syngenta, I don't recall any acquisitions recently, although uh, Israel Gadera obviously is a huge acquisition here in Israel. What would you say is the best way of collaboration from what you see knowing the nature of the Israeli startups, of collaboration between Syngenta and Israeli startups? It's a complex question. <laughs> Can I take the GM one instead? No. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think that all throughout this panel, you heard quite a lot of, of kind of check boxes that you should think about when you talk to a company like Syngenta or like the other ones around here. Um, I think one of the key challenges is understanding why we do it why we would collaborate, we, meaning the big companies, with a small company. And we've had actually a discussion about this last night over dinner. And, and it is about de-risking or, or spreading the risk. Um, people think it's about money. It's actually not cheap to do collaborations. Uh, it is actually quite expensive. Uh, so the way for us to look at it is to see where does the risk lie? What does this really give us? Does it give us shortening of, of, of time to market of a product? Um, and again, you heard some numbers from Pepsi. I mean, we have blockbuster products that are over a billion dollar product. Uh, one year of sales justifies a lot. But from the moment that we talk about this with a young startup, to the moment that hits the market, to the moment it reaches the billion dollars, um, that is 10 years, maybe 15 years. Um, so there is quite a long path in between that. And uh, I said this in, the, in a few other ag conferences that I was on a panel. And I said, well, in agriculture, it's very simple. Anything times a million acres is millions. And there are many more than just one million acres in ag. So the business cases always come up as these nice hockey sticks with billions and billions of dollars behind them. And I think the point is to be realistic of what, what, uh, pe what people in companies like ours look at. And that is, one is the risk, and two is what is the value. It might be a value because we want to aim at potatoes that fit to uh, Pepsi. And that means that the quality has to be right, or the size has to be right, the processing capabilities, et cetera, et cetera. So if you talk to our business unit that runs potatoes, they're very open for collaborations. Actually, nowadays, over the last two years, we've went through a strategic transformation that opened the door to a lot more collaborations because we see ourselves as an integrator, as bringing solutions, not just technologies, single technologies. Uh, so people are very open to these type of questions of what else can I bring to the table? Um, but you have to be ripe enough to, one, make sure you're talking to the right people, by the way. 
um, because these organizations are so big, you could waste your time talking to the wrong people. That's why each of the organizations has a collaboration type of unit that will direct you to the right place and make sure that you have a relatively decent business case and uh, we understand where this could be going. But I don't have to... Well, you, the, you asked the question. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I yeah. am under, sure. uh, under so pressure of the organizer, so... Uh, yeah. So I, I'll finish with one comment, and that is, uh, I guess for Syngenta 1, there is Zayim Gedera or Syngenta Israel, which is actually a very good uh, kind of point to enter into Syngenta. There is a, a person that actually looked at all collaborations for Syngenta in Israel in that unit. Um, I get approached a lot by people, and just make sure you know who you're talking to and why you're talking to that person. If it's an R&D collaboration, it's different than a business collaboration, uh, enabling technologies versus products. It's quite a different story, so just get it right. And we also appreciate the fact that it's never too bad to have an Israeli champion within the company, but uh, not <laughs> saying <laughs> anything. <laughs> so, uh, Philip, now, uh, and I want to have two minutes for also left for Avi, so you were the first in all the questions, so now a very short uh, question and answer. All we heard, the position of PepsiCo and uh, Monsanto and uh, Syngenta, Bayer has uh, been, actually, from what we discussed before this panel, you also mentioned the, the name Evogen, so I'm happy about this, but uh, what is, how early would Bayer go, and what do you look for, uh, the basis for collaboration? So maybe one thing, so acquisition is necessary because that's the driving of investment. So we have to make sure that investors will continue to invest in hacks. So we will continue acquisition. Acquisition is one plus one equals one. Don't forget about that. Uh, partnership is one plus one e equals three. Uh, so when we do the one plus one equals one uh, action, it's because we, we want to make a change in our, usually in our company and want to make a change in the market. That's the reason of an acquisition. Uh, partnership, uh, what we want to see is to see more early stage innovation. Um, the reason for that is we are, we are several companies, we compete and it's good, but sometimes we don't have enough early stage innovation project and we may all jump on it and because we jump on it, uh, we may kill it. Yeah, that's the nature of, of sometimes competition. So. Driving more early stage innovation by, by working differently uh, with investors, with incubation projects, with startup companies, being a bit more innovative uh, in the way we create partnership is, is a requirement. <coughs> I believe in crop science. Uh, and you will see changes in, 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 in bio crop science because we have been quite conservative, uh, but we are going to make some changes, quite bold changes, how we approach early stage innovation, because we see as, as a necessity for the ag industry, not only for us. Thank you. As you can appreciate, as representing a university, I'm very happy about the going early approach. So I appreciate two minutes. And uh, I'll be just, I'll, you know, I'll give you, as, uh, actually, the, the last uh, responder. So uh, one uh, question uh, for the end of it. Uh, you know, as always, uh, people have sometimes complaints uh, on the government, but things are going. Uh, I think very nicely in the agriculture area in Israel in terms of investment. I think, the, and Steve mentioned it, that we have a growing uh, interest in uh, Israeli agriculture technologies. We have some issues to deal with. Uh, for example, when we want to license out a technology from Israel to Monsanto, or PepsiCo, or Syngenta, or Bayer, we have a lot of issues that we are dealing with the Ministry of Economy, and I'm sure that these issues will just expand and we, we must find solutions. But if you have to summarize, what is actually Israel offering for this uh, prestigious company sitting here on the stage? What would you say is the highlight of what Israel is offering? And why should they continue to come and fly all the way to Israel and not uh, settle with the nice uh, other startups in the world? Okay, actually, maybe this should be the first question I should answer, uh, not the last one, but uh, uh, you know that Israel if I am trying to summarize the last 65 years, has all the good reasons not to have any agriculture over here. Because we don't have water, we don't have any land, we don't have any labor. Two thirds of the country are actually a desert. Uh, if I want to be politically correct, I would say we have a complex geopolitical uh, environment. <laughs> and uh, we are far away from the export market. 
So actually all these are very good reasons not to have agriculture, but actually we have a very nice one. And you know, as always you say, necessity is the mother of all inventions. And I think that the relative advantage of the Israel R&D is that we were able to ensure a high degree of self-supply that we faced what, we, what everybody is discussing now as food security actually issues actually 65 years ago. Not now that everybody is discussing these points. And we had to be able to guarantee advantage and novelty in agriculture. And uh, all of it resulted from the relative advantage of the Israeli uh, agriculture R&D, that if I want to summarize it in two sentences, I would say that we have a proven experience of actually being able to develop a multidisciplinary R&D activity. And this is what is important. We, we were able to solve up-to-date agriculture problems and we are able to perform high-tech R&D uh, project for tomorrow's agriculture. And if I really want to summarize, uh, for me at least, for us at the ministry, the word agriculture is not just agriculture. We prefer to say that agri is our culture since the biblical times till today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the distinguished panelists, um, and I hope we will see you a lot in uh, Israel.